split into three chapters. The film opens with a Catholic family and a priest heading toward an open field with a coffin that's being carried on a horse. In the first chapter of the film, the family walks for hours to find the perfect spot to bury the body of their father figure. At last, they find a perfect spot under a giant tree that shadows a large surface in the open field, leaving the mother and the older son behind with the casket. The rest of the family and the priest walk away from that field. The older son digs a six feet deep ditch in the ground as his mother watches him from a distance. Once he prepares the perfect grave, he pulls the casket inside the grave and lies on top of it before the burial. The scene is then reversed to a few days back to get a better understanding of the current burial. The same Catholic family is shown in its home where the firstborn son is and demeaned by the father all the time. He then finds the opportunity to mock and taunt his wife for birthing a useless son. This Catholic family includes a short-tempered and evil father figure whose face is half burned, a paranoid mother who is a strict believer of God, two teenage sons, and a daughter. One night, the father goes to his pig farm that's a few steps away from his home. As he peeks at the pigs from above the wooden fence, the pig starts snorting loudly and in a strange manner that not only bothers the father, but it enrages him. He tries to quiet them using a wooden stick but for some reason, the pigs do not stop snorting. He storms back into his home and grabs his first son by his arm while he's still sleeping. Eve takes the boy to the pig farm. The other two siblings, who were sleeping in the same room as the first son, are woken up by the disturbance in the middle of the night. They look out of the window to see what their father has planned for their older brother. Meanwhile, the father pushes his son toward the fence and makes him watch the snorting pigs as if he had something to do with it. When the father leaves the farm, the son envisions him facing an untamed pig in the wilderness which perhaps counts as one of his worst fears. The scene once again shifts to a partially nude boy who wakes up on top of a vehicle that's parked in the middle of an open land. He jumps down from the top of the vehicle and walks away. Back inside the Catholic home, the mother is listening to a podcast on the radio while assembling some praying beads. Her stubborn husband shows up and orders her to make a scrub, with the towel-wrapped ingredients that he's providing her. In fear of her infant waking up from her husband's raised voice, the mother rudely tells him to stay quiet. The father laughs at the mother's audacity to quiet him and salutes her. Not giving the father a chance to rage out, the mother walks away from the scene. Among the three siblings, the first son tries to go after his mother but his rigid father pushes him back on the table and leaves. Now left alone on the dining table, the three siblings look at each other with worrisome looks on their faces, shocking the audience. The younger siblings turn out to be hateful toward the older brother. The sister reminds the older brother that he is not only disliked by their father, but is also not their actual biological brother. The following evening, the younger siblings are sent to the woods to hunt a bird and pluck its feathers with their bare hands. They skin the deceased bird and collect its feathers in a white piece of cloth. Meanwhile, the mother has lit some candles in her room and is praying to God while making sure she isn't disturbing her sleeping infant. At the same time, the father shows up in the room to grab his jacket. When he watches his wife praying to God with faith, he tries to distract her by reminding her of the kids playing outside. When the wife doesn't respond, he sits down with her and starts praying to God. The only difference is that he changes the verses of the Bible and entails how brutally and mercilessly Jesus was crucified and executed, just to prove his ill beliefs about God and Jesus. The wife becomes scared of her husband and tells him to get out of the room. While laughing, the husband puts on his jacket, salutes his wife, and leaves the room. Then the wife picks up her praying beads once again and starts praying to God but she gets distracted by her infant, who has started crying due to the father's nuisance. In the meantime, the teenage brothers are seen carving wooden sticks with their knives to make sharp tools. The younger brother starts older brother and calls him multiple sisters. When he starts throwing wood shavings at the older brother and tries to get his attention, the older brother points a knife at him in a threatening manner. Luckily, their father witnesses this and immediately lowers the older brother's hands and the knife. That night, the mother goes to visit the priest, who is busy preaching the words of God and Jesus to few people in the community, who have shown up at his church. As the priest ends his preaching, the mother walks to him and has a word with him. In the meantime, the older son is attacked by three kids who are hiding their faces with masks. Despite the masks on, two of the three attackers can be identified as the younger siblings while the third one can be assumed to be someone from the neighborhood. The three kids knock out the older brother and take him to an abandoned structure where they try to bring him back to consciousness. They poke the older brother with a stick and check if he's still alive or not. When the older brother wakes up, the younger siblings back off immediately. Sadly, the older brother is tied up so he cannot do much in his defense. At the same time, an older man shows up from inside the structure who is also hiding his identity with a mask. He tells the younger siblings and the neighborhood girl to run far away now that their work here is done. However, the kids don't leave until they get paid. The old man throws pennies on the floor which the kids pick up and leave. As the kids leave, the old man takes off his mask and unveils his identity to the older brother. Much to his shock, the kidnapper turns out to be his own father. The old man prepares his son for a tough talk and a reality check now that he finds his son old enough. Despite finding his son a disappointment, the father claims to be getting old and tired of working and sweating hard to provide food for his family. Hence, he wants his son to man up and start contributing to the family. To make things more clear, the old man shocks his son with a disgusting truth he has been hiding from the family. 
He takes out another kidnapped victim from inside the abandoned structure and tells his son to take his life so that the family can have dinner for tonight. Whereas the older son is in a state of shock, the lunatic father claims that it is hard to provide food for the family which is why he chose cannibalism over real food. He also states that the boy was caught robbing food from their fields, which is why he deserves to be punished this way. Meanwhile, the younger siblings and the neighborhood girl take off their masks and split the pennies equally. While the younger siblings have no sympathies or worries regarding their older brother, the neighborhood girl becomes concerned and regrets participating in this evil doing. After this, the siblings leave the place with their money, and the neighborhood girl stays and watches the old man talk to his older son from behind the tall fences. She sees that the older son has been tied up to a chair and his mouth has been stuffed with a piece of cloth so he doesn't scream. Now, the old man lifts up the sack from his victim's face who turns out to be a friend of the older son. Before taking out the cloth from the son's mouth, the father threatens him not to make any noise. Now, while imposing his stupid beliefs onto his son, he forcefully hands his son a knife and makes him slit his friend's throat. As the friend slowly perishes in pain and struggle, the father dips his finger into the friend's slit throat and wets it with the warm blood that's rushing out of the cut. He then makes a Christian cross on his son's forehead with the blood caught on his finger and claims that he has baptized him. Meanwhile, back in the house, the mother comes home and puts her infant to sleep while continuously praying to God. She feels a storm coming so she goes out to take off the washed clothes and sheets hanging from the wire that have gone dry by now. While removing the hanged clothes, she is met by her husband who has brought home her older son covered in blood. The maniac father claims to his wife that he has baptized their older son. The wife gets the hint of what he has done and starts hitting him, while repetitively calling her husband a monster. The wife pushes her husband back and goes inside her home. The father has nothing in his defense to say but a salute, after the hideous thing he has done to his older son. The following night, the mother goes to her children's room with a bowl of holy water and a piece of cloth. As the older brother is in deep sleep, she cleans his wounds and the residual blood of the victim on his body with holy water, and then prays to God to repent the sins of her son. While she's at it, the younger son squints open his eyes and catches a glimpse of his older brother getting special treatment from their mother. When the mother leaves, the older son gets disturbing visions in his sleep and recaps everything that went down the following night. The next morning, the mother wakes her younger children, grabs them by their heads, and forcefully takes them to the priest. There, it is revealed that she has handed them to the priest so he can take them far away from their home while she catches a demon who has risen once again. Here, the demon is referred to as her husband. Once the priest takes the children in, the mother walks back to her home where she preaches God's words to his older son and makes him feel guilty for being involved in the last night's act. She tells her son to repent of his sins as he had purposefully slaughtered a man. The mother continues influencing her son with fear of God and tells him to take the life of the demon. She wants him to feed its meat to the pigs in order to wash himself pure of the sin he has just committed. The scene then cuts to the sadistic father, who gets drunk in the woods and comes back home flirting with his wife and saying demeaning things to her. She serves him food and tells him to pray to God before eating. The father claims that the only god in this house is him, since he provides food and that he will not pray or worship anyone else. As he's making this conflicted statement, the older brother shows up from behind and stabs his Once his father falls down on the ground, he gets on top of him and stabs him several times until he perishes. In the meantime, the mother stays back and witnesses the cruel demise of her husband with no emotion, revealing himself to be in his mother's strong influence. The older son drags his father's corpse to the pig farm and feeds him to the pigs, just like how his mother wanted him to do. Here ends the first chapter and begins the second chapter of the film, which reflects on the father's past and his journey to becoming a cannibal. The father, in his middle age, is a penniless man who isn't capable of providing his mother with food. By the looks of his house, it is certain that his mother is also a strict preacher of God. Along with being a religious person, she demeans her son and always reminds him of his pathetic state of being penniless, who cannot even provide for his home. One morning, he finds his mother eating the blandest soup. He tries to greet her and take out a plate for himself but she acts rude and cold. She doesn't allow him to have a plate of soup since he is not the one providing it. Using fear of religion as a manipulation tool, the old mother goes closer to her son and whispers the most demeaning things a mother could say to her son. This provokes him to sneak out of the house and see a girl at night. He tries to ask her rate for getting intimate. She takes this as an offense and kicks him out of her room. Following this, the father stays the night in the fields and targets an innocent person as his first victim. He slaughters his victim and provides food at home that evening. Her mother praises him for bringing food into the house and tells him to stay stronger so that he can keep bringing food home without skipping a day. Anyhow, the mother doesn't let her son eat food before she's done praying. She also admits knowing his affair with the girl in town. However, before the son can give any explanations, she tells him to bring that girl to her. The following night, the son experiences horrid nightmares where he sees someone wearing a sewn mask made out of a pig's skin. He also sees that man providing flesh as food to his future family. Unbeknownst to him, his daughter foretells him of his demise. He wakes up in a cold sweat in the middle of an open field in the morning. He goes back home and washes his face with cold water to forget what he just saw in his dreams. The following morning, he goes to visit the girl he's having an affair with and tries to warn her about an evil that's behind him. 
The girl laughs at him and tries to make him forget his words by getting intimate with him. When the night falls and they sleep, the son once again envisions the bloodied man in a pig's mask. Unconsciously, he makes weird noises that wake the girl up. She tries to calm him down but he keeps squealing like a scared dog and tells the girl to get out of the room. The next day, the girl comes to his home to visit the mother who gives her baby clothes since she's expecting a baby. The son hears it from behind the walls and becomes shattered to hear that his girl is expecting. He breaks out of his consciousness and surrenders himself to his dark side which makes him slaughter his mother and his girl. He then cooks their and tries to feed it to their corpses while also trying to talk to them at the dinner table. His deteriorating mental health can also be witnessed when he converses with corpses and simulates multiple arguments with his deceased mother. As he gets completely overshadowed by his cannibalistic side, the second chapter ends. The third chapter is dedicated to the cannibal's love life which is not at all loving. After cannibalizing his mother and his one-night stand girl, the man is left alone in this world to survive on his own. With no company of his loved ones left, fitted in his head is a thought that he mustn't return home without food. Hence, he has gotten good at arranging his food. He has made a car wrecking yard his common ground for hunting his victims. One night, with his bare hands, he severs the limbs of his victim in the wrecking yard, puts them in a sack, and comes home to his mother's corpse whom he still finds alive. Since it has been ages, her mother's corpse has been completely decayed and rotten. The cannibal has placed his mother's rotten corpse on the bed beside him. He kisses her face and goes to the kitchen to cook some food. While he cooks human flesh, he looks into thin air and converses as if he's seeing someone but in reality, there is no one. Along with his mother's corpse, his mental health has also rotten. He sees and talks to things that do not exist in reality. While cooking, he speaks to the voices in his head and tries to justify his reasons for consuming other humans since it is very hard to arrange real food according to him. At last, he prepares a bowl of soup using human flesh for one of his victims whom he has taken in as a hostage in the name of love. He refers to the girl as Rosalita, his one true love. The crazy cannibal confesses to being in love with her yet he has her tied up to a chair and he's placed the chair in front of the TV that has no cable. He goes to her and gives her the soup, but she manages to use her knees to spill it. The cannibal talks softly to her and tries to confess how compassionately he has made the soup for her, but the girl curses at him and asks to be released. While she's having a breakdown, the lunatic claims to be hearing his mother who is yelling at him for picking the wrong girl. He shouts out loud and lets his mother know that Rosalita is not like the others. This behavior scares the innocent Rosalita even more, so she ends up spitting in the lunatic's face. He doesn't appreciate it at all. He grabs her by the hair and licks her entire face while saying some dark and humiliating stuff to her. In the end, he doesn't harm her since she is the love of his life. Haunted by his loved ones every night, the crazy cannibal sees the pig mask guy who has him hostage. He has been tied up and is helpless in front of the pig mask guy who may be the manifestation of his cannibalistic tendencies. He also sees himself getting baptized by the devil, along with the Christian cross that's drawn to his forehead with blood, just like the one he drew on his son in the first chapter. As the of the night end, the helpless man finds himself sleeping in one of the abandoned cars at the junkyard. He puts clothes on and walks toward the highway. Meanwhile, Rosalita wakes up tied up in a bed next to the rotten corpse of the cannibal's mother. She screams hopelessly and scoots away from the corpse since she's all tied up, so there's nothing she can do besides moving away. Back at the highway, he ends up visiting a small roadside bar where he takes a few shots of alcohol and displays misconduct that grabs other customers' attention. When the night falls, he comes back to his filthy sewer-like home and sleeps in between his mother's corpse and the traumatized Rosalita. Likewise every night, he finds himself under the pigman's captivation in his sleep. Only this time, he sees his mother standing by the pigman's side enjoying what is being done to him. He snaps out of his nightmare the next morning and makes himself a lousy meal which is plain water and chunks of human meat cooked together. As he's lost in his thoughts, he is met by the ghost of his mother, which is more of a manifestation of what his mother would think of him if she was alive, created by his messed up mind. The manifestation calls him useless and curses at him while also reminding him of being put inside a coffin one day. He says what he has to say in his defense and makes the manifestation go away while also whimpering like a scared kid. Moments later, he goes to the highway for a hunt. There, he spots a skinny defenseless girl who is in hopes of getting a car lift on the highway. He starts walking straight in her direction with a heavy metal chain in his hands which not only makes her nervous but leads her straight into the unsupervised car junkyard, his hunting ground. Unaware of the fact that she's fallen right into the trap, the innocent girl goes into hiding somewhere in the junkyard. The cannibal takes his time to search for her. After interrogating multiple cars, he finally finds his target hiding behind a rusty old jeep. He quietly goes after her and places his hand on her head from behind. As he severs her limb to limb, the scene cuts to the cannibal returning home. Once he returns to his home, he finds the love of his life gone. The cannibal finds her stuffed toy, which he had given to her, on the dusty floor. His heart gets shattered by this revelation. He looks in the mirror and becomes disappointed to see his reflection. He ends up punching the mirror and shattering it into pieces. He then goes to his room to vent his feelings with his mother. He yells at the rotten corpse and blames her for his life turning out to be like this. He accuses her of never having taken care of her son which turned him cold. In the end, he pours kerosene all over his mother's decomposed corpse and lights it up with fire. 
This results in his house burning to the ground and him lying in the pig man's lap, hinting that he's fallen under the captivation of the pig man, who is also a manifestation of his cannibal side. 